And I call the member for Hughes. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, about a fortnight ago, I was uh, very honoured to make a trip to Japan, uh, where I am the member for Dawson and the member for McKellar, and two of my uh, colleagues from the Labor side of Parliament uh, made visits to several power stations, a steel plant, and also had meetings uh, with the Japanese Ministry of the Economy, Trade and Industry, with J Power, which is one of Japan's largest electricity generators, and also with Japan Oil, Gas <coughs> and Metals National Corporation. And the message that we had from all of those three organisations, three organisations that have been majorly responsible for the economic success of Japan over many years, and they said unequivocally, renewables are not cost competitive. That was the message coming out of Japan. For Japan, they have done their sums, and they have worked out the cheapest way that they can generate electricity to supply their people is to pay a premium and import coal all the way from Australia to use in their latest technology coal generation plants, Deputy Speaker. That was the clear message that they gave us. We're also, the previous month before we went, the Japanese government had reduced, uh, had, sorry, it had reduced its carbon emissions uh, targets and they were actually trying to achieve in their electricity sector a 26 per cent reduction from 2013 levels to 2030, very similar to what we have here in Australia. However, they weren't doing that by locking those targets in legislation and mandating them with punitive penalties. And in fact, amongst those targets, I thought it was interesting, that their targets for intermittent generation of wind and solar combined was a mere 9.4 per cent of Japan's total electricity generation by the year 2030. In contrast, under the NEG modelling, we are looking at something like a 29 to 30 per cent target of intermittent generation facilities. And the more intermittent generation capacity that you put into the grid, the higher costs that you have. We're also able to visit Japan's Asogo Clean Coal Plant in Yokohama, in fact only six kilometres from downtown Yokohama was laded, that uses ultra supercritical technology, not only to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, but also to reduce sulphur oxide, nitrogen oxide and also particulate matter. And when it comes to uh, Japan, they're also at the moment planning to roll out something like another 30 new coal fire power stations across their nation. They have a similar issue to we do. Their existing coal fleet is ageing and they have done the sums and they are going to replace their existing coal fleet with the latest technology coal fired power stations. That is what Japan is doing to ensure their nation stays economically competitive. Also, um, last week, Deputy Speaker, it was very interesting that some new data came out from the People's Republic of China on their China Energy Portal that showed the year-on-year -year growth in power generation from the first, sorry, the second quarter 2018 this year compared to the second quarter 2017. And it showed uh, all up a 244 <coughs> uh, terawatt hour growth. And the main growth came from thermal generation, 176 extra terawatt hours of electricity were generated using thermal generation, that's coal and gas in China, in that second quarter. Now, to put that number into some type of comparison, Australia's total thermal generation as of 2018 is around 150 terawatt hours of electricity. So what China has added in the last 12 months alone in electricity generation from thermal resources is actually more than Australia's entire production in electricity from thermal resources 
over an entire year. So whatever the we do, if we wipe that out over an entire year, that 